Thank you. Well, hello. <clears throat> My name's Luke. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm part of our preaching team. And yesterday was week three of my three-year-old Hank's uh, t-ball season. And uh, just for the record, if any of you ever come to me and are like, hey, uh, do you think that my three-year-old should play organized sports? I'm going to look at you like you're a crazy person and say, of course they should not play organized sports. But uh, here I am uh, coaching a three-year-old organized sports t-ball team. So it's just, it's crazy and it's cute and it's funny. Um, but Hank said something funny to Molly uh, yesterday as he was getting ready. He said, Mom, I have to tuck my shirt in. She said, why? He said, so that I look like a ball player. Because uh, I've been telling him in these early weeks, like, listen, man, if you look like a ball player, you are one. If you look like a ball player, you are one. See, as, a, as someone that played baseball through college, that was kind of a mantra, that you got to look the part. you got to uh, have your uniform tucked in. you got to you know, look the right way. Because if you look like a ball player, you are one. And yet, here's the truth. That ain't true. Because I saw plenty of people that looked really good getting off the bus. I mean, they had the, they had the wristbands and the Oakleys and the pants were tight and everything looked crisp. And, uh, but, but we actually had a phrase for guys like this. They were on the all-bus team because they look great coming off the bus, but they get on the field and you'd be like, all right, we're going to be fine. These guys think, right? Um, and, and so there's this reality. If you can, you can dress up, you can play the part, but just looking the part doesn't mean you actually are a good player. Well, tonight in this passage, God is going to come after those, especially those husbands who are on the all bus team, who are dressed up as godly, who are playing the part, who look like they kind of have their faith and their life and their act together. But in fact, especially through the way they treat their wife, their family, they're far from him. So this is an intense night. The intensity comes a lot from this key word that keeps showing up in this passage here in verses 10 through 16. Uh, the word is faithless. Maybe you noticed that as we read that just a moment ago, but five times that word faithless is repeated. Look at verse 10. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? Verse 11, Judah has been faithless. Verse 14, the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she's your companion and wife by covenant. Verse 15, let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. The end of verse 16, so guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Now we hear faithless and we think it just means kind of the absence of faith or the absence of trust, but it's actually in the Hebrew a much darker word than that. It, it, it's, it, it could also be translated as treacherous. Here's a definition of this word. It's to act treacherously, to be unfaithful, to break faith, not trustworthy or reliable to a person or a standard. So it's not just the absence of faith, like, oh, I haven't been perfect. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying you have been treacherous. You've been deceitful. It has with it the idea, see, see this word and, and the Hebrew word for garment are the same word, same root word. So it has with it the idea of dressing up, that you're clothing yourself a certain way, you're, you're trying to look a certain part, but you're actually someone totally different. There's a kind of deceit in it. So there's an intensity to this passage, there's an intensity to this sermon. Uh, my guess is for most of us, we're not that familiar with the book of Malachi. It tends to be in the part of our Bibles that's that crunchy part, you know, where if you have like the gold edge, it's like that's the part that looks really gold because you've never read it. Um, and, and so most of us aren't that familiar with Malachi. But if you're familiar with Malachi, it's probably because of Malachi 2.16. And if there's one verse that you think you might know from the Bible in the book of Malachi, it would be Malachi 2.16. God hates divorce. That's what you've heard, perhaps. This comes from the NIV translation uh, from 1984, and here was that translation of that verse. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. It feels pretty clear. God hates divorce. And so a lot of you have heard that before, and a lot of Christian culture has kind of dwelt on this reality before, and, and as a result, there's this kind of sense among lots of Christians that, that divorce is this kind of unforgivable sin. Some of you have lived this because you've had to go through a divorce. And as you've kind of tried to re-enter a Christian community after that, you feel like you've 
been branded with this scarlet D. And you always have to explain and you always have to talk about it and it's super uncomfortable and you know people kind of look down on you. I'm here to tell you tonight that divorce is not an unforgivable sin. But the question is, is is that really what this verse is saying? Malachi 2.16, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. Is Malachi 2.16 really saying that God hates divorce? Uh, This is a great name for a scholar, Gordon P. Hugenberger. Gordon P. Hugenberger, uh, he wrote the commentary notes for the ESV study Bible for Malachi, and here's what he says. He says, the Hebrew text of this verse is one of the most difficult passages in the Old Testament to translate, with the result that the two main alternative translations proposed for this verse are strongly disputed. So here's a scholar, a a theologically conservative scholar, saying it's difficult not just to figure out what this verse means, but what it says. It's hard to translate it. Like the the Hebrew and the English, it's clunky and it's difficult. And so even as you read English translations, you see, wow, there's, there's some like debate about what this verse is really saying. Let me show you just four translations. These are all, I think, very good uh, translations. Just so you know, the way this works is groups of scholars who know the ancient uh, and original languages, who are familiar with the manuscript history, they all get together and they translate these things. And their desire is not to say new things, but to just let the original text say what it says, but in English. And when they get to this verse, look at how differently they do it. So the ESV, English Standard Version, that's what I'm preaching from. Here's here's what it says. For the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. And already you go, wait a minute, hold on. I thought in in the last one, God said he hated divorce. And now it seems like it's not God who's, it's being talked about, it's the husband. The man who does not love his wife, but divorces her. The CSB, Christian Standard Bible, says a similar thing. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice. So again, it's not uh, God hating in this translation. It's, it's the husband hating and therefore divorcing. What about the New American Standard? This is also a really good translation. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong. So here now it's saying that God hates two things. God hates divorce and hates the person who covers his garment with wrong or who does violence. Then the NIV, the New International Version, they updated their translation in 2011. And here's what they did then. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect. Now, I know that some of you are like, see, that's why you can't trust the Bible. That's why it's just all these translations and it's all this big game of telephone. This is one verse that the scholar said, this is the most difficult verse. It's not all like this. Here's, here's, so here's the question. Does Malachi 2.16 say that God hates divorce? Maybe. Maybe. Like, it might. But but what makes this difficult is that when it comes to every other thing that the Bible says God hates, he always hates it. So in Proverbs 6, there's a list of the things that God hates. It's a list of pride and deceit and hands that shed innocent blood and feet that run to evil. And God always hates those things. There's never a time like, well, pride's okay as long as it's in this context. No, he's always against that. He's always against oppression. He's always against deceit. But when it comes to divorce, if God hates divorce, why has he allowed in the Mosaic law and in Jesus and in the apostle Paul, why has he allowed for these moments when divorce would be acceptable? The two things that are the clearest from scripture are from Jesus in Matthew 19, that divorce is an okay thing. It's not a preferred thing. It's not a desired thing. But it's an okay thing in the eyes of God when there's been adultery. In 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul says that that also includes abandonment. When when a Christian is abandoned by an unbelieving spouse, they're no longer bound to stay married. And so if God hates divorce, why are there these exceptions? So at best, we could say God maybe hates divorce. He surely hates the things that would cause a divorce. He surely hates all the fallout and the brokenness and the scar tissue and the pain that comes from divorce. 
But, but as we translate this, we go, maybe he hates it. Now, our church has taken the position uh, over the years since uh, we all came together as Redemption Church in 2011 that there were two acceptable reasons for divorce, which, as I've already said, were adultery and abandonment, and abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. As a result of what we've looked at and what we're going to look at here tonight in this passage, we've actually uh, made an adjustment to how we're communicating that in our uh, membership packet. We're, we've rewritten our whole membership packet, not just on the basis of this, but a lot of other things that just needed clarity and uh, needed um, just fine-tuning so we can communicate, here's where we stand on stuff. And one of the things that we looked at based on this passage was kind of what we had said about divorce. So I want to show you kind of where we, what we had said and uh, the, the adjustment that we're making there. Here's, here's what our statement now says. Biblically, divorce is permitted but not required on the grounds of sexual immorality, that's porneia is the Greek word, or abandonment. And this is the new sentence. We believe physical, sexual, and other types of abuse may be considered a form of abandonment. Stopping abuse may require separation and may lead to divorce. Marriage reconciliation can be the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work, but it may not always be wise, possible, or biblically commanded. So we're not saying there's a third category. We're saying that abuse being dealt with treacherously might be a kind of form of abandonment. That's in the part of our membership packet where we're communicating our convictions. This is not what you have to agree with. In order to be a member, you just need to know that this is where we stand as a church. And here's the thing that I am painfully aware of as a leader in this church, is that we have not always handled situations related to abuse well as a church leadership here at Redemption Gateway. We've had a number of times when especially a wife has come to us not usually physical abuse, but other kinds of abuse. And, and in our desire to protect and reunify the marriage, we've often done damage to the people in the marriage. And so we're learning, we're growing, we're seeking to try to apply this more faithfully. So does God hate divorce? Maybe. But there are some things in this passage that are very clear that God is concerned about. So here's what we're going to do tonight is we're going to allow the clear stuff of this passage to inform the unclear stuff. That's actually a good principle of biblical interpretation is you let the, the, the clear stuff shape your view of the unclear. So that's where we're going to go. So would you pray with me? And then we will dig into this a little bit deeper. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight uh, asking you to speak by your word, asking for clarity where it's clear, God, would you bring conviction where conviction is needed? And would you bring encouragement and hope where encouragement and hope are needed? Would you remind us of your faithfulness in the midst of our treachery? We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So what is clear from Malachi 2 and what's clear from the rest of Scripture? Uh, three things we want to talk about tonight. The first one is this. God might hate divorce, but he definitely loves marriage. God might hate divorce, but he definitely loves marriage. We'll talk about this from Malachi too, but if we just zoom out for a second and we look at the whole scripture, we see that God loves marriage. At the very beginning, God makes Adam and Eve in his image, but, but before he makes Eve, he makes Adam and he sees, you know what, everything in this world I've made is good, but it's not good that the man should be alone. And so he takes uh, he puts Adam to sleep and he takes a rib from his side and he forms Eve. And Adam and Eve are image bearers of God and they are one. They are united. They're married. And when God sees this marriage, he says, now this is very good. This is all before sin. This is very, very good. And then throughout the rest of the scriptures, you see God describes himself as a husband to his people. Jesus uses similar, similar terminology. He says he's the bridegroom. And the church is his bride. Ephesians 5, the apostle Paul lays out this reality that the gospel is actually a, a, a embodied in marriage. That when a husband loves his wife and when a wife uh, respects and follows her husband, that that actually uh, shows what the relationship between God and his people is like. And that marriage is actually supposed to be a picture of the good news of God, that God loves us, that he gave himself, that he died to cleanse us to bring us into relationship with him. And so the Bible then finishes 
Just like it began, it began with a marriage, it finishes with a marriage. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb where there's this celebration that God has come to take his people as his bride. This is a big deal. Right? Sometimes people in the culture, they, they'll ask Christians, like, hey, how come you guys are so obsessed with marriage? How come all, all you guys in the media, Christian media, you just all talk about marriage all the time? Which the first thing I'd say is, it's because anytime a Christian goes on any news show, what do they ask about? Sexuality and marriage. So I don't know that it's the main thing we're obsessed with, but it is a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is because it pictures the gospel. That while we were faithless and treacherous, while we say, oh, yes, God, we love you, but we really love the stuff God made. While we say, oh, yes, God, I'm devoted to you, but really the only person we're devoted to is ourselves. Despite that reality, God has come near in Jesus and he has suffered and he has won us and he has suffered in our place and died to forgive us and to cleanse us and to nourish us and to treasure us. That's the good news of the gospel. Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. So God might hate divorce, but he loves marriage and he loves marriage because it pictures that he's the faithful husband to his people. That really explains the concern that's coming up in verses 10 to 12. See, the first part of this passage here in Malachi 2 is related to this idea that what a lot of these Jewish men were doing was marrying foreign women who worshiped foreign gods. In some cases, they would just marry foreign women. And, and in other cases, they were actually divorcing their Jewish wives in order to marry these foreign women who worshiped foreign gods. Look, look at what it says, verse 10. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Speaking to the Jews. Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless and abomination. That's a big word. <laughs> abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Gosh, what is this big abomination? For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign God. Look at how serious God takes this, verse 12. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendants of the man who does this. Now, now get this, this is really important. God's concern with people marrying foreign wives was not about race. He was not saying that interracial marriage is bad. He was not saying that people from two different nations or ethnicities getting married, that, that's bad. He wasn't saying that at all. The issue is that if you're marrying a foreign woman who serves a foreign God, there's a very good chance she's going to draw your heart away from your God to hers. We see this over and over in scripture. The, the easiest example is uh, Solomon. Solomon, think about this. He had, the scripture says, more than 700 wives. He right, was the first 700 club was Solomon. And a bunch of them, a bunch of them were were foreign women, and what you see is Solomon starts out really good, and then after a while, his heart gets drawn away. And so that's the concern. God's saying, listen, I want to be your husband. I want to be in covenant with you. And you're, you're abandoning that, and you're going in this other direction. God might hate divorce, but he definitely loves marriage. The next verses in verse 13 says this. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So some women, so some husbands were marrying foreign wives. Other husbands were just disregarding the vows they'd made. And in their case, what it looked like was, I'm just going to divorce this girl. I don't want her anymore. Discarded. Here's what's fascinating. In our day, many Christian men have used these verses to protect themselves from getting divorced while they continue to mistreat their wives. So, so, so some, some Christian men have gone, you know what? God hates divorce. So you can't get divorced. You can't divorce me. I haven't had an affair, and I'm not abandoning you. Yeah, but you're treating her like garbage. You're not, you're not honoring her the way God intended you to honor her. 
And in that culture, that meant, oh, just get divorced. In this culture, it means I'm going to stay married because in marriage, I have power. I have control. So here's the second thing we need to see tonight is that God might hate divorce, but he definitely loves women and children. God might hate divorce, but he definitely loves women and children. Verses 14 and 15 indicate that what God really wants here is a cared for wife and godly kids. The Lord, verse 14, was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you've been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you're supposed to see this woman as your companion, as your friend, as your partner, as your helper. The word helper gets kind of beat up a lot, but just think about the imagery of Eve. Eve is not made out of a bone in Adam's head as though she's above him. She's also not made out of a bone out of Adam's feet as though she's below him. She's made out of a bone out of Adam's side. Why? Because she is beside him. They are both made in the image of God. They are co-laborers as they seek to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and fulfill God's commands. They're supposed to be together in this. She's described in verse 14 as the wife of your youth. That's always this phrase to describe tenderness, kindness. God wants a a cared for wife. Verse 15, did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? See, see what's going on is, is when you're not honoring your vows, you're not living as one. And what was the one God seeking? Verse 15, godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit. Let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. God loves women and children. Some of you women need to hear this tonight. God loves women and he loves you. And you might feel neglected and you might feel unseen and you might feel unheard. God loves you. Here's an important question to ask tonight. What does God love more? Marriage or women? What does God love more? Marriage or women? And the reality is, in in some churches like ours that take the Bible seriously and see that God really loves women or loves marriage, we've so elevated marriage that it's become more important than women. And, And part of me understands this because after all, marriage does symbolize the gospel. But here's the reality. Women are made in the image of God. And women will last forever. We're not sure what marriage in the new heavens and the new earth is going to look like. Right? At best, it's like, well, you might be like angels. Oh, I don't know what that means, Jesus, but I'm super confused. I don't know. But God loves marriage, yes. But God loves women. And it breaks his heart when he sees women mistreated, abandoned, abused by their husbands. All through the scriptures, you see God caring for wives and women who are neglected. I was just reading the other day, you know, like many of you, I'm I'm starting my Bible in a year plan again, and uh, we'll see how far we get this year. I don't know. We'll do our best. But uh, I just was reading in Genesis 16, and in Genesis 16, God has made this promise to Abram and Sarah that they're going to have all these descendants. The only problem is they can't have a baby. And so Sarah says, you know what, Uh, Abram, why don't you just sleep with my maidservant, Hagar? And so he does, and sure enough, she gets pregnant. And sure enough, Sarah hates her because she's jealous. And they mistreat her and they neglect her and they kind of kick her to the curb. But God shows up. And and she actually says to God, you are a God of seeing. I have seen him who looks after me, she says. If you've been neglected by your husband, there's a God who looks after you. In Exodus 21, God makes provision for wives who would not be cared for in a marriage to find a healthy way out. Jesus' approach to divorce was designed to protect wives, right? In Jesus' day, there was this easy peasy, no fault divorce thing. A man could just divorce his wife for any reason. And in that culture, she couldn't work. It was hard to get remarried. And so she was left destitute. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You can't just get divorced for any reason. In 1 Peter 3, 
God says that husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way so that, it says at the end of the verse, their prayers will not be hindered. So here's what that means. That means God is saying, I care about women. I care about wives being taken care of. So husbands, if you don't live with your wife in an understanding way, I'm not listening to you. You're going to treat her like, la, 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 I'm going to live for me. God's going, I can do that. La, 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 I can't hear you. Get this. Even what God was saying as he gives his commands to husbands in Ephesians 5, that they are to love their wives the way Christ loved the church. Do you know how radical that is? To say, husbands, die for her. Sacrifice for her. Put yourself below her. That's radical. That was radical in the first century where women were treated like property. It's radical today. Where at best husbands say, well, you can be my equal. But no, no, no. The scripture goes further. Die for her. God loves women. God loves children. He, he might hate divorce. He definitely loves marriage. He definitely loves wives and kids. And because God loves marriage and because God loves wives and kids, here's the third thing we need to see tonight is that God might hate divorce, but he definitely hates hypocrisy and abuse. This is the nub of the issue. Look again at verse 13. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Right here, here's the image you have. You have these husbands, again, who are dressing up. They're on the all-bus team. That's what treachery is. It's deceitful. It's putting on this phony set of clothes and acting like something you're not. And these guys are going, oh, we're worshiping you, pouring out tears on your altar. Oh God, we just want, we just want what you want. And God's going, la, 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 I can't hear you. And they're going, why God, why? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, treacherous, deceitful, harmful. You get another picture of this. And again, we had all the confusion about what verse 16 means, but, but all of the translations indicate that, that when a, a husband mistreats his wife in the way that's being talked about here, it's a violent act. Look at verse 16. For the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Does violence to the one he was called to protect, one of the other translations said. So, so there's a reality here that a husband is, is showing up publicly before God and saying, here I am, God, I love you so much. But in his private actions, is harming her. Even that, that phrase, covers his garment with violence, communicates uh, this idea that in a lot of Middle Eastern weddings, there was this idea that as a husband and a wife got married, there would be a shawl uh, or there would be a covering and they would cover, the husband would cover over himself and the bride and they would come under this tent of protection. And this is a way of saying, instead of, you, you've acted like this is this godly, sacred moment but you're actually using the cover of worshiping me to hurt her. It's hypocrisy. Get this. Hypocrisy is not saying one thing and doing another. Hypocrisy is playing a role. The word hypocrite, it comes from Greek drama. In Greek drama, the, the hypocrite was the one who wore the two-faced mask. On one side was a smile. And so the hypocrite would look and smile and you could see, oh, this character's happy. And then the hypocrite would turn around and be frowning and you say, oh, this character is so sad. And that hypocrite was this two-faced person who was trying to play to the crowd and be something that he wasn't. Who did Jesus have his strongest critiques for? The Pharisees, why? Because they were hypocrites. Now listen, not all hypocrites are abusers. But all abusers are hypocrites. 
Because you have to. you got to play the role. you got to play the part. And get this. I know abuse happens where, where a wife will abuse a husband. I know that happens. It doesn't happen as often. But the thrust of this passage is about husbands who are treacherous, destructive, violent with their wives, manipulatively hypocritical. So let me ask you, gentlemen, tonight, are you a manipulative hypocrite? You, you put on a show of godliness. But you're faithless to the wife of your youth. See, some of you, I, I know some of you, the only time you ever open a door for your wife as she gets in the car is at church. Why? You don't open it for her anywhere else. But you open for her Open it for here. Why? Some of you, you act and you talk and you pray a certain way when you're here, when you're around other Christians. And, and your wife and your kids, they never see you act like that at home. They don't hear you talk like that. They don't hear you pray like that. Some of you, you're very in control of all these details of your wife's life. What she's allowed to wear when you come to church, where you're allowed to sit. And it's not just because you have a preference of, I don't want to be in the air conditioning. It's like, no, you, you want to sit in a certain place where you look godly. But it's controlling and it's manipulative and you have to get your way. Some of you men serve regularly with smiles and with joy while you unapologetically use porn at home and everyone in your family knows it. Some of you men, you use pornography and you cultivate in yourself these perverted desires that you then manipulate and guilt and shame your wife into complying with. And they don't bring greater oneness. They actually bring greater separation and harm. And you abuse her and you hold the Bible over her saying, you have to honor your, our marital rights. when really you're just a pervert. Some of you, you're tightly in control of the money. You won't let your wife get a job. You won't let her earn extra income. And you say, oh, you know what, it's just better. Uh, you know, because, because we're following God, we think it'd be better for a wife to stay home and raise the kids and we'll just live on one income. And, and you kind of cloak it in this godliness. And the reality is, if she had any money, you know she'd leave. And you control the purse strings. Some of you, you insist a lot. You talk a lot about how she needs to submit to you. But you don't talk at all about how you need to love her sacrificially. You don't model that. You don't show that. You don't help her feel that. But you lord your leadership over her. The, the, the word for submit in Ephesians 5 is to come up under protection. It's that image of the, of the garment again. And instead of inviting her into your protection, you invite her into your harm. Some of you, you keep your, friend, your, your wife very isolated. She doesn't have friends. She doesn't have relationships. She can't go hang out with people. And you're around a lot of stuff and you're involved in a lot of stuff. People are like, man, you're so connected. How, where's your wife? And you kind of, well, yeah, you know, she, you give off the impression she's just not that committed to God. You just don't let her have friends. Some of you compliment her at church. Oh, my lovely bride. And then you call her names at home. And here's the thing. This is all treacherous. It's deceitful. It's cunning. And so, so here's the deal. You can fool people. You can, you can fool me. You can fool pastors. You can fool friends. But you can't fool God. He sees it. He sees every act of hypocrisy. He sees every act of deceit. He sees every act of treachery. He sees every moment of control and manipulation and abuse. He sees every bit of it. 
And because Jesus is so big and because Jesus is so great, there is hope for you if you'll repent. I got to tell you, for you to really change that way of absolute uh, abusing, domineering, controlling, that way of thinking, that way of living, that's going to take you months. That might take you years. You're going to have to work really, really hard to retrain yourself in lots of things with lots of help from other people, probably professional people. But repentance is possible. Forgiveness is possible. But here's the thing you got to know tonight. Until you repent, You should go to bed every night terrified to fall into the hands of a living God who loves marriage and who loves women and who loves children and who you are hurting. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you are the faithful husband. There's not a man in this room, there's not a man on this stage who has been the faithful husband like you have. And so I thank you that you laid your life down for me, you laid your life down for us. I thank you that you set us free from needing to be in control, from needing things to be about us. You can set us free from hypocrisy, you can set us free from playing a role. So God, we ask you tonight to bring us into your light, to bring us into freedom, to bring us into repentance. God, if we won't turn to you, would we experience the appropriate warning from this passage? God, we need your grace. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.